So at this point, uh, we're going to take a list of names for people who may have questions, comments. So we'll ask you to um, go to the mic, which is right here, so that everybody can hear you. Uh, I did a lot of research, and uh, in the state of California, it's estimated about $14 billion of income comes into the state through the marijuana industry, a lot of that through this county. Um, and it's been estimated anywhere from 25 to 66 percent of the area's economy comes from marijuana. I'm concerned about having this be another one crop or one industry kind of area. I don't want to see that. I think marijuana uh, can be a part of it, but not. I don't want to depend on it. I've had clients leave the area because they, uh, as one succinctly put it, I'm tired of seeing uh, marijuana on the cover of every issue of the Willits News, and I don't want to be identified with a place like that. So that's something that uh, has been mentioned, the stigma of it. Theoretically, marijuana cannot be used for real estate purchases, which is what I deal with unless it's well laundered. So um, it will, it can and may affect uh, and probably will affect real estate values, which kind of is what the economy rides on, as we saw in the real estate um, uh, market failed, so did the national and then the international economy failed because of the failure of the real estate economy. Uh, marijuana does account for such things as local income tax, pro I mean property tax, income tax, local construction, much, much of it under the table, but money spent locally, automobiles and trucks, equipments used in the industry, uh, seasonal laborers who spend money locally, groceries, gasoline. Gasoline accounts for, as my understanding, about 40 percent the gasoline tax of the world's income. Bars and restaurants, leased land and private security measures. These are good things. Bad things are, of course, illegal water diversions in combination with the uh, poorly planned Willis Bypass, which has is, which is damaged a very fragile uh, aquifer. Um, where we see a very um, water-hungry crop. We're into our second or third generation of young people in this area who are who see marijuana as their way of making an income. And, uh, and that, uh, that bothers me. I think that it's okay for some people, um, but certainly not um, an entire generation of people seeing that. Uh, I'm glad to see that Holly and Gabe came back and are, as far as I know, are not growers, but are doing very good things for our community. And I'm not trying to um, uh, diminish uh, uh, growers who are doing things in a, in a good way. Drug cartels um, that have come from Mexico and Russia and other places are invading our forest lands. Uh, we want to get rid of that. Maybe that's one thing that legalization will help to do. We have a serious substance abuse problem in this county. And um, we have a serious domestic abuse um, violence uh, problem. A significant number of school-aged children are not getting an effective education. They're in the D or below average. I think it's something like 40 percent of our young people right now in our mm -hmm. school system. So uh, enhancing our schools is really important. Uh, we're looking at an untaxed crop right now, and we're looking at money going to expensive vacations and underground building of lavish homes and that sort of thing. Um, I want to see it on the tax rolls. Okay, I just have a quick question about the discharge permit that farmers would be getting. Is that something that applies to all farmers or just marijuana farms? We have chosen, uh, the Animal Growers Association has chosen to support the bill because we feel like it's a, a pathway to compliance and a chance for solid dialogue about it. There's a lot of industry, uh, alfalfa farmers especially, are really not enthused about it. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of, of Real farmers, larger farmers, um, there's, there's a lot of definitely debate. The Central Valley, the representative in the Ag Committee from the Central Valley was most, um, did not vote in favor of the bill, did not, he, he did not vote, he voted that it should not get out of the Ag Committee. Um, so there's a lot of debate for sure. That said, the bill is it's definitely still going to get carved up and figured out and decided around, so I don't really know a whole lot more than that. It, yeah, that's my understanding, is that it would create a statewide water discharge program for all farms. Because that was one of the initial things was um, you can't regulate one industry 
it's, it's got to be, it's, you know, it's across the board. And so this is also a question of cannabis right now is not regulated as a crop. It's because it's a Schedule One federal substance. It doesn't have any, any uh, legality under the Department of Agriculture. So listing it under Department of Agriculture would then give it the same application, you know, the same things that apply to all farmers would apply to cannabis farmers. And so you know, there's a whole lot of discussion of how are we going to do this and really we just need to use the existing laws because we have a whole set of them for everything and rather than making more laws we should just apply how they work and give, you know, good farm. My argument is that if you give good farmers a pathway to compliance it's way easier to deal with bad farmers. I would add also that you're dead on about the monocrop bill and as a diversified farmer, as a CSA farmer, a vegetable producer, um, I think it's absolutely um, imperative that farms have a diversified crop portfolio and not monocrop and be able to focus on the holistic aspect of the community. It's a triple bottom line question of um, there should be equal legs of the stool for community, ecology, and economy. And you know, American industry tends to value the bottom line and we say that the bottom line has to be this bifurcated, you know, triple effect. So this maybe is a two-part question. Uh, it seems to me, or everything I've been reading, is that there's going to be an initiative that's going to be on the ballot in 216. And I mean, uh, it seems like, and everybody talks about it, okay, it's going to be legal. So my question is, if you know, why isn't the state getting out in front of this, the legislature, to create a bill that would be more in their control? Because if it's the initiative that the people write, then that's going to be the law. Is that correct? Yes, but the trouble with that is that somebody would then have to take responsibility for it. This can's been kicked down the road since 215 passed. So nobody, you know, the only people who want to step up and be like, I'll regulate it, are essentially backed by the sheriffs and counties. And so now, you know, Bonta's bill, Wood's bill, these potentially are regulatory things that we may see move forward, but pretty much universally they've been like, eh, we'll wait till the people figure it out. So if the people figure it out and write the initiative, which I think a lot of people are, that becomes the law, is that correct? Definitely. So can, I just don't know if this is true, can the state pass a law that's against the federal law? Yes. They can? Absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, I know the people can. 215 was, what? But no, but that was an initiative done by the people. Oregon was done by the people, Colorado was done by the people, but could the legislature of the state of California write a bill and pass it that's against a federal law? I would say it happens all the time. States pass laws, then the feds strikes them down. Okay, that's right, that. because that happened in the South a lot. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So I just don't understand the state not getting in front of this because it looks like a fait accompli, uh, and that, then they're going to have to do what the people say. Uh, it's just that question of which, you know, who's going to... Who wants to step up? Who wants to... And, well, and, Newsom's stepping up, right? I mean, he's taking some control there, but not enough. Huh? There's a lot of good discussion at this point. You know, I think the initiative campaign is... Is gathering steam. Uh, there has definitely become a, a solid question of, uh, up until now, it's, it's like the article quoted in the Associated Press the other day, you might as well think that the weed fairy brings it to the dispensary. So now we've realized, like, okay, it is going to grow somewhere. We're going to have to figure out who's going to grow it, how they're going to grow it. And in California, there's been a whole lot of people growing it for a long time, so we ought to figure out how to make sure that those people, if they're doing the right thing by their community environment, get to keep growing it. At the state level, you have to get a lot of people to agree. So it's true, <laughs> enough people to agree. It's true that something could get passed by a public initiative, but if the you know, sheriff's departments and you know, uh, by way the League of California Cities, if those folks aren't on board, they're gonna make it very challenging. So even if the most brilliant local voter initiative was, was put forward, it would probably get you know, just beaten to splits. I don't know. So I, I think that one of the positive things about the legislature doing it is that in theory maybe we could come up with something that they wouldn't fight quite so um, viciously. And I had actually, I was hoping that Tom Allman could come today because I know that he just went to Colorado and spoke with their law enforcement because the idea right now is trying to figure out things that could be put in our law that would work better than some of the things that have been tried in Colorado. And, you know, so we'll see how it goes. Gavin Newsom indeed uh, will be running for governor in 2018, and he is pro legalization. And no doubt he will be 
bringing many new first-time voters to the uh, to the polls is the result of his attitude towards uh, a legalization. So that's going to be uh, pretty interesting as it rolls out. And there's uh, probably what half a dozen bills uh, in, in in the state right now that will. 13 and 17. It's going to get crafted uh, in in some way, shape, or form. Um, I'm just back from a week in Denver. I just got back last week, and uh, pretty fascinating experience to see what's going on with their economy. I interviewed a lot of people, went to a number of dispensaries, my first time, I might add. I have never seen an economy as vibrant as what is going on in Colorado. Now, I don't attribute it to uh, recreational legalization. Um, their main economy is probably tourism, not unlike Mendocino County, but uh, property values are through the roof. They are going up at about 14% a year. Some of you may have you know, seen this. This has been going around the county here. A little newspaper, this came out in the uh, Ukiah Daily Journal some time ago, some months ago. This is a current issue of Newsweek, looking at the state of affairs here in this country. Um, you know, the fact that they're willing to put out special editions on this, it, it, it's out of the closet. I mean, if we don't embrace this, then uh, I don't know what. Yes, I am working with Jane and a few other people on uh, creation of a cannabis museum here in, in the county and specifically in Willits. Uh, I have a collection that's uh, started about 45 years ago. It's, uh, it's rather deep. It's not definitive by any means, but uh, it's... Uh, it's a pretty good uh, foundation to get the ball rolling. Um, I exhibited uh, for the first time publicly at the Emerald Cup this last year, and I think a few of you uh, saw it there, Jane. And uh, I got a pretty major uh, thumbs up and encouragement to proceed forward with this, and uh, that indeed is happening. Actually, just a plea, if any of you have any curious memorabilia from, from the day, from the late 60s, actually, I started collecting this uh, uh, Looking, looking at the, uh, the the beat generation in the 50s, and you know Harry Anslinger's what he what he did in 1938 uh, that helped create you know this mess that we're in today. It's a long, convoluted story, but um, uh, indeed the story does need to be told. And here in the uh, alleged Emerald Triangle, uh, you know Willits has consistently been uh, front page newspapers in the Bay Area and beyond, thanks to the internet. And, uh, you know, I think we'd, uh, we'd be fools if we don't um, recognize the, uh, the gorilla in the room and, uh, and embrace it and try and move forward with this in a very positive way because, uh, indeed, it is happening. It is coming, and it's looking like 2016 is going to be the year. So we can go into it uh, kicking and screaming, or we can embrace it and figure out how to how to um, not only capitalize on it, but, you know, there's a medicinal side to it. There's, I mean, nobody's even brought up hemp yet, which is, you know, one of the most incredible plants grown in the world. Anyway, I could kind of go on a long, long time on that, but uh, thank you for the time, and uh, looking forward to hearing somebody else speak. Thank you, Richard. I just wanted you to clarify uh, what having a lab here means, um, because I think a lot of people don't really understand that. They've heard the term lab and things that go boom and blow up and catch fire. <laughs> so I wanted someone to explain that. For us as farmers, uh, cannabis, uh, you start the seeds, you don't know what it's going to be. You get a rough idea, but especially when you start talking about CBDs, medicines, cancer, patients, you need to know what it is you're working with. And so a rough idea, you know, try to figure out for my ma um, what's the appropriate dosage. Oh, too much? Not good. You know, so um, testing is going to give, testing does now give us the ability to figure out exactly what it is we're working with, how to standardize it, and also it, it provides a backstop to the consumer. It tells the consumer this is what it is, and it also guarantees, you know, you can have it tested to make sure there's no molds and uh, mildews and poisons and things in it. So um, it's a way that the farmer can demonstrate that there's a clean product, a clean medicine, and it's also... Um, a way that farmers are able to refine the strains that they grow. A lot of people don't understand that there are as many kinds of cannabis as there are snowflakes in a blizzard. And they all do different things. And we have this whole system, this culture, who has gathered up these individual strains that have come from all over the world, and they all grow them for different reasons. This one makes my back not hurt. This one helps with the rheumatoid. And we, they all work. 
because it's not like somebody's growing it to sell it to somebody because it does that, because that's not how sales work. They grow it because that's, it, it works for them and they use it. And especially you know, for us, we grow a lot of different strains. And I need to know which ones they are. I want to know which, you know, so if you, you, you cross a strain, you take a mother and a father and you put them together, the, 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 the offspring are all, they're sisters. And so you don't know which ones they're going to be. And some of them are going to be more like the father and some are going to be more like the mother. So if you're interested in getting the one that are like the mother or like the father, either way, then you need, you know, up until now, it was always like, oh, this one smells like the ogre. This one smells like the strawberry. So I know. But the testing actually said, this one is the ogre. This one is the strawberry. And so we'll test them. We'll put the profiles from last year in the binder. And then when I pre-test my strains this year, I say, okay, this one is just like that. That's the one I want. That one's mama's CBD. This one is this. This one is this. And it gives us the ability to figure out exactly what we're working with. So it's, it's not um, things that go boom. It's things that help people figure out medicine and build on the craft heritage that we have here. You could think of, what's the um, lab in Ukiah that you take your well water to? Alpha Labs. You know, you could think of it more, more in that line. Every vineyard has... Most vineyards have labs in-house to let them uh, do that analysis, but one of the things that Casey touched on and RJ brought up that we haven't even brought up is, you know, there's a whole group in Leightonville that's working on medicinal, specifically medicinal usage only. And there's, there's for the lay person, you know, there's the part of the plant that is an intoxicant and the part that's not. And for many of the people who are using this purely for medicinal purposes, there's some illnesses that are pretty much helped by the non-intoxicating. I mean, th these guys are talking about CBDs and, you know, but, and there's a lot to it, but the, and a, a lab would allow that analysis to happen. And in a recreational sense, it would allow, much like a vineyard has its own lab, you know, nothing exploding. We're talking about white lab coats basically saying that, you know, you could, you'll be okay because this doesn't have pesticides in it, things like that. Okay, so there's been this tremendous attempt to break it down and say, um, uh, well, CBD, good, medicine, THC, bad, high. And that's not how it works at all. There's a whole, you know, for instance, mama has cancer. Um, the studies are showing that if you give mama straight CBD, it's going to make her tumors bigger. But if you give her a blend that has lots of THC and lots of CBD and all the other magical things that we don't have any idea what they are, then maybe her cancer will get better. Maybe not, maybe it stays the same, who knows. But until we're able to actually do the testing, so, you know, CBDs, straight CBD medicine is excellent for children with seizures. But the whole idea is that if I consume a plant, if I consume a substance because it makes me feel good, that's a medicinal effect. As an adult, I have the right in a society of conscious thinking individuals to make that choice. So, you know, I, I'm always very, very leery about the attempt to split off one part of it and say, well, this part's okay, but the rest of it's bad. I'm Jed Diamond, and uh, I'm really glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. This is kind of a long time coming, and will continue to be coming for quite some time. Uh, I, I feel like I'm wearing three hats today. I, uh, like most of you, I'm, I'm a resident here, and I'm concerned about our, the well-being of our community and our economy. Uh, I'm also a father and a grandfather of 14 grandchildren. I'm concerned about, you know, what they do and how they're healthy and what substances they may use. Uh, I'm also a professional. I have a PhD in international health, and I've been working with uh, people who have drug problems uh, for the last 40-some-odd years. It's hard to believe for me, but in 1973, I wrote a paper that was a published in a professional journal saying that I thought that the best thing that we could do for the health of people who have drug problems was to legalize drugs. Um, and at that time, that was kind of a radical idea. But I think we now recognize that criminalizing people who have drug problems, whether the problems are with alcohol or marijuana or any other drug, is not helpful. Um, and you know, destroys, as uh, Jane so uh, aptly put, just the well-being of a whole community when you're always worried that your neighbors or yourself are going to be arrested. So um, I think what people need to, to recognize from a, a treatment perspective, which isn't what everybody's interested in, is that 
Uh, we know that a lot of people, and Bill mentioned this, uh, suffer from drug problems. We see it, they end up in jails, they end up in treatment programs. What people don't recognize is because we don't see all the people that use drugs without problems. So the, the, the truth is, uh, from most of the studies that I've been doing over the last 40 years, and many others have, is that 90%, this is about average, 90% of people that use about any drug, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, or any, any drug you can think of, do not have problems. They don't have problems. So the people that have problems are the 10%, and you know, that, that's important. And I want, you know, I've been treating the 10% and will continue to be, and I think one of the benefits of legalization, among other things, is we'll be able not only to treat these people better, we'll be able to study the, both the benefits and the problems and the health benefits, so my question for you all on the panel or anybody else, Tom, or anybody else in the audience is that the benefit right now of legalization is that we have some experience in other states before California does this. And all those things you talked about of having a vibrant local economy, I presume that some people are looking at what's going on in Colorado and Washington and other places to be able to say, all right, here's some of the things that we can learn from their experience that we can and should get behind and incorporate into whatever bills we have. So I'd be interested if any of you all or anybody else that's here, you know, has any specific input into what we have learned or what you've learned from looking at the other states that we could apply here. I'm sure there's lots, but one that comes to mind and Correct me if I am wrong, but my understanding is that in Colorado, it's primarily indoor, you know, like, or they're, they're seeking to have like a birth to death to be able to track every single movement. And I am really against us taking on a model like that. I mean, talk about environmental degradation. So I think if we're going to succeed in setting ourselves apart as far as quality, um, that we should not go that way. But I'm sure there's other things. My two sons live in Colorado. They're 17 and 19 and non-marijuana users, uh, anti-marijuana. And uh, since it's become legal there, neither them nor their friends has it had any effect on them. So there's a lot of people that worry if it becomes legal, then you know, everybody's going to do it and uh, parents are going to lose control of their kids. But I don't see that being a problem. You know, that was brought up at that economic summit uh, that I went to because they were talking about, so the, and it really is all theoretical. I mean, we're talking this, t <laughs> guessing, but they were talking about, you know, with the stigma gone, with it being legalized, how many, what percentage of the population is going to choose to maybe take more, what percent of that population isn't already doing it now that would then start because it was legal. I mean, I, I, that's one of the reasons why I don't think of it as this like amazing, you know, silver bullet for our economic taxation problems is because I do wonder what, I imagine that shift will be over time. And it's, it's hard to look, you know, look back at prohibition, which I often do. I think we can learn a lot from history. You know, there was spikes in drinking and there was a lot of, um, you know, women were able to drink in the speakeasies and things like that. There was uh, jet, more gender crossing, you know, during Prohibition. But then after, you know, I don't know if there was, a, I don't think there was a spike in new drinking because it was then legal. You know, I just, I think it's going to be a really interesting um, anthropological experience to see how it changes our community, you know, because of those norms. There's some, there's some fascinating stuff in terms of economics here. If you look at the prohibition of alcohol, there's very little price differentiation under prohibition. Alcohol pretty much sells for alcohol's price. Then you get prohibition ends, all of a sudden you see $1,000 bottles of wine. You see really expensive alcohol, you see really cheap alcohol. Right now, cannabis moves at market price, give or take. There might be a few points difference in the market, but in general, it's more or less market price. If you see an exit from prohibition, if you see a price differentiation of just $5 a gram, which is 
you know, there, there's estimates that it could be as high as $60 a gram for ultra premium versus low grade. Um, at $5 a gram, you see an extra $1,000 to the dispensary and an extra $1,000 to the farmer. So this is a very real economic thing that we're talking about here as we come out from under prohibition. There's a craft heritage that's been created here. There's a craft system of farmers. And the medicine that's grown here, the cannabis, the marijuana, is special. And it's very unique. Emerald Growers Association has been doing a study, a survey of cannabis farmers. We tell them, this is what I'd say to people. I say, these are the questions that you would never put down on paper for anybody. I want you to put them on paper. I want you to put them in a the little blue folder over there without your name on it. We're going to gather up the data. The data coming back is pretty fascinating. It shows that the average cannabis farm family makes 102,000 a year, which is about 7,000 less than the national farm family average. The average cannabis farm worker makes 45,000 a year, which is it's 16 to 20 higher than the national average for farm workers. So the data shows that cannabis farm owners pay themselves less because they pay their workers more. Data also shows that 40% of our farms produce other crops for market and that 75% of our farms also produce food crops. So we're seeing this picture become very clear, which we all knew all along, that these are diversified small farms that care about their communities, they participate, you know, a lot of my baseball coaches, a lot of my soccer, my wrestling coaches, a lot of people who were in my life and really dedicated time and energy to me as a child were cannabis farmers because they had that time and energy to do so. And I think there's been a tremendous value judgment placed on it that has made us unable to really look at it. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting is this question of giving. Um, people like to give to charitable causes. This is something that we all know. Cannabis farmers are the same way. But the trouble is, you've always had to give very secretly. You couldn't say, oh, I gave $100,000 to the schools, because then somebody's going to come and take you to jail. So as we come out from under prohibition, farmers will have the ability to contribute to the society in ways that hasn't been able to happen before, partially because they'll be able to, and partially because they'll be able to, to receive the recognition for it, because that's a big part of it, is to say, yeah, I did that. I think there's a tremendous economic boon to be had from this thing, so long as we are very careful to sustain the heritage. And the answer is not grow more. The answer is raise the quality. We have quality in this community. We need to stand by it. We need to backstop it and maintain the craft heritage. People always ask me, how quickly can you scale? That's the number one question I get from industry outside the area. And I say, by definition, craft farms do not scale. We cannot scale. That's craft. And I say, I, I can't, by definition. I can get more farmers, and I can talk to more farms, and we can together have a scale, and that's sort of a co-op model that you know, we're hoping to get into as legalization moves forward. But for the time being, it, it, the system exists in which buyers come to farms all over this county, they come with large amounts of money, and they take away product because they, ha they use economies of scale. They have, I have a large amount of money, so you're going to give me your product at a cheap price. If farmers are able to organize, make themselves into marketing services co-ops, we can't do agricultural co-ops for the time being because it's not an agricultural product, but we can make a marketing services co-op that will say, this co-op helps our farmers represent the quality of medicine that they produce, helps them define their marketing bios, helps them define what it is that makes their medicine special and different than anything in the world. Because we have this whole system of unique micro-scale farms, these tiny little farms all over the place with different north slope, south slope, different climates, coastal, inland, all sorts of little pockets in the hollers, little nice slopes up on the hill. And so we have all this different unique stories, and you put them all together, and it's like Captain Planet. So what we're hoping to do is, is launch this marketing services co-op that's going to put together a catalog so that for the first time, people in the state of California are going to be able to see the quality of medicine coming off of the farms in this area because farmers are going to be there with their smiling faces right on the cover. And that's the goal is to be able to finally communicate the good parts of the thing so that we backstop the value. And for us, as a, as a diversified farm, we are seeing a higher price in the legitimate white market than people do in the black market. The black market right now is anywhere from 10 to 18 a pound, give or take. In the white market, we're seeing two grand. So it's significantly higher than what's happening in the black market. And we're doing it because we've certified our farm, we've backstopped our quality, we demonstrate to the public that this is the real thing and that's why they want it. So my argument is that by building this transparency through to the consumer so they understand the quality of medicine that's coming off the farms in this area, we will raise the value of the product. As a vegetable producer, if I tried to compete with Safeway, I would go out of business, plain and simple. I cannot produce wholesale vegetables at the price that Safeway can do it for. 
That said, I can create a story that defines my farm as special and different than Safeway, and people will pay me the price for my produce that I need to stay in business. The same exact extrapolation holds true for cannabis. So we can't scale, we must stay craft, but if we do so and we organize appropriately, this community, you know, Willits, the Triangle, it's gonna be Napa except for cannabis. The can of tourism, people that wanna come and visit. And then there's a whole question of ancillary industries, things that people will do with cannabis Labs is one thing that we don't really want here in our communities, but that's an that's a industrial lab grade process, but things like baked goods, things like uh, salves and lotions and tinctures, there's a whole herbal industry that is waiting to launch out of this area, it just needs access to legal products. So there's a, you know, a tremendous range of economic potentials that our people are just waiting to access. I just have a comment. I lived in Kentucky many years ago, and. It had been a long time since Prohibition had gone through, but the state was very interesting in that it had dry counties and wet counties. And regarding alcohol, the dry counties, you could get more alcohol cheaper. They had speakeasies. People would, you know, this is the guy with the coat that has all these little bottles on the inside, and you never knew what it was going to be. So if we don't legalize it, in our county, let alone in our state. I mean, it just keeps, you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what's real. And I don't, I mean, those counties were losing a lot of money to the other counties right next door for the people who would go and buy real stuff. So it just makes sense in so many ways because you can control it. Your kids, a lot of, I mean, I can remember meeting people there who, would go get drunk simply because it was illegal. I mean, it's weird how people think. If you know who can get drunk and who can, you know, who can imbibe and who can't, you can control it. You can actually talk to people. You can work with things so much better. You know, as a child of this community, uh, growing up here, I was like, oh, I can see this is bullshit. You guys can't figure this out, so I, I don't have to listen to anything you say about it. It's like raising our kids, we, we sort of pretend like, ah, oh, kids are stupid. They don't know. It's like, yeah, right, we know every bit of it all the time, the whole thing. And the fact that y'all couldn't figure it out really was very, very difficult for us as children. So um, that's why, again, it's very, very important to be here. And it's really, I'm, I'm very grateful. We're talking like a couple of different things here. And like one is, is it going to legalize? And how's it going to legalize? And what's that going to look like? And what our control of that in, in Mendocino County is you know, relatively limited unless we're you know, really pushing for a bill, or we're writing our own initiative, or we have a million dollars to support an initiative. So what's going to happen is it's going to legalize at some level. And what, what would be great, what I'd like, and since I've gotten here, after we have two great city council people here, two people that would be maybe in favor of us, like ending our ban of sale of cannabis within the town of Willits. Willits is still yet to actually collect a tax dollar on the sale of cannabis, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, 45 places that we can buy alcohol in this town, zero that you can legally buy cannabis. So we'd probably like to see that, well, maybe 43 now that we don't have over here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, however it's going to change, it's going to be an evolving process. What's going to be this year, it's going to be different than next year, it's going to be different than two years and three years from now because they're going to be figuring this out. And you know, getting around the laws, well, we have a, a, a ban now, which would be great to end, and, and I know I'm speaking to the two that are in support, in support of that. But if we could get or support local businesses that are selling cannabis, help support a trade organization or any type of, like, CSA model or supporting farmers that are selling products to also add cannabis, like, legitimately or quasi-legitimately to that, to that list. Um, there are ways to get around selling things like the CSA models. Now, I guess so my, my question is, is how, how, how can we create a way, locally, because we're in, in Willits, how, how can we create a way for businesses in Willits to, to uh, or farmers in Willits, to begin to distribute cannabis to currently people who are currently patients, and then as it changes, to people who aren't patients? And how can we recruit beyond, uh, I know the Emerald Grown idea is, is, is wonderful, but even just you know, more locally even than that, because that might be some right beyond all California. So if we're looking at something very locally, how can we support our Mendocino growers, our, our, our Willits growers, our In the Hills growers, to 
to unify in a way, can we create a storefront or a business in town that has cannabis, has plants, you know, is, if we have a dispensary in town, you know, that would be really like a great step to like legitimize something. So somebody in this town is working like, like within the storefront or in an office space. Um, it probably wouldn't even hurt for somebody or a group of people to get together to just hold like a, an office space where we're beginning to like anticipate like people can come who are farmers who are interested in moving to the area, who are from out of the area, who want to come in and say, well, how is, what's going on here? Well, here's the people you can talk to. Here's an office space where you can do it in. And there's people there who are either a farmer or an expert or a rotating crew of people with different types of office hours. But that's my, that's my rant. Thanks, I'm Mike. Thank you. I do just, in, in reference to that, comment uh, the you know the city council has recently still chosen to maintain the majority of the council members has chosen to maintain the ban i think what needs to happen is this i think what needs to happen is community conversation i i speak to many people out in the community that really do not want to see a dispensary in town that is a segment of our community and I think it's really important to be respectful of that and try to figure out you know where they're coming from I, I think largely it's coming from a place of of fear and feeling like a dispensary equals crime equals you know an element in the community that that folks don't want I mean it's important if you're gonna try to move forward-looking policy forward to have these kind of conversations. I, I just want to thank you all for being here and the town hall for taking this on and moving into the bigger room because you can see that this is a, it's an important topic that we all have a lot of feelings about. And I see my fellow councilwoman in the back as well as um, our supervisors here and he's on the committee for uh, looking at this at for Mendocino County, so it, it would be interesting to hear from them as well. I remember the good old days when I could just sit in the room and not have to talk, but <laughs> this is my new life. This crowd is much more friendly than I had in Covalo, where they needed deputy sheriff desperately. There's a lot of needs all over the county. One thing that helps me in looking at the marijuana situation is to think of the housing bubble. We all understand that because we just went through it. We had a house that was worth 500000 It slowly went down, and we thought about selling it, and we couldn't find the bottom price until it hit like 250 or 200 So that's a huge change, and it devastated socially. It changed our spending habits. It was a big deal. John McCowan and I are on the ad hoc committee, and we are politely wrestling with each other over all these details. And I've learned a tremendous amount. I thought I knew a lot about pot from selling property. It's a big subject. And the price that has gone down so far has been like the housing bubble popping. We're still in a pot bubble right now, and we have been our whole lives here in Willis. So it's hard to see things when you're in the middle of it. But it is changing. It's interesting here, Casey, and different people with different agendas, and you can see that I would have a different agenda than you do. But we're discussing something that's going through a big change, and likely prices are going to hit a very low and change things a lot. Our area here, Willis, Covalo, Laytonville, I didn't realize we're ground zero of the pot growing. We provide, I think, 50% of the pot for what? California? I mean, the triangle is estimated to provide 60 to 75% of the entire nation. I can't believe that. See, I've heard it, but I can't say it publicly. That means if it changes, if it goes down, much more, it'll be at the price of producing it, and then that changes lives for everybody growing it. So we're on the edge of something scary, and it's funny that for all our life of realizing how limited Washington is and Sacramento, we're thinking, okay, we have to deal with Sacramento and get a good bill for us. I don't think that's happened a lot during my life so far. It tends to be that corporations and other things influence them more than I do, and I think that'll happen now, but we're working with five other counties to make our voice be louder and advocate for local control and some simple things we all agree on. Every day I'm coming up with different ideas and once we, we talked about the language and we had conference calls with all these other counties, like 
for the last two hours. I walked out of the room after an hour. They're fighting over every sentence, but we've got it together. Everybody sees it from a different point of view. So the most important thing we can do is continue these conversations, get our ideas together, and be together as a community, because it's going to be a difficult challenge. No matter whether it's from the ballot or from the legislature, it's not going to be what we want. It'll probably be imperfect, and there'll be a number of years of uncomfortable, changing, black market, just disruption. So it's going to be a challenging time for us, no matter what happens. I have a question for you. Good. Tom, what do you see your role is in terms of this community and the different ideas and what this community wants? What do you see as your role? That's why I'm here today. I don't really have a demand of what I want from the pot solution. I want our county to thrive. We're looking at it as if the, if you look at the tax revenue we get, and John and I fight over this too, but if it lowers just 20%, we're in a big world of hurt because we don't have much reserve. So it's gonna change being able to pay our county employees, being able to have the sheriff fix the roads, it touches everything in our lives. It's trying to get a look at what's gonna happen and take the first step with this ad hoc, and we'll report out in a couple weeks, and then try to lay out three or four ways to move forward, because it's the first time in a while the county has the courage to do this, and then try to sucker somebody else to be on the, that next ad hoc meeting committee, but it'll probably be me again. But at this point, I'm just listening, trying to protect the citizens from the change of the head, and keep the peace during this big change that's gonna be happening. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Cannabis is the only industry in which uh, it's regulated that it can only come from this state and it has to stay in this state. So the regulations currently say that California cannabis can only be sold in California, but we all know that's not what happens. As the thing moves forward, demand, you know, Colorado went legal and everybody said, oh, you guys are all out, There's no, nobody's going to come to, to Northern California anymore, everybody's going to go to Colorado. That didn't happen. So the demand is going to continue to grow. The, the, the demand exists eastward from here, and there's a lot of farms that their product goes east. So as the thing moves legally and more states move legal and the thing continues to move, um, long term, we're definitely experiencing the potential for craft farmers to see real gains, real economic wins, and, and a real serious uptick. We could end up Napa if we get together and figure it out. And, and you know, Napa, it works for everybody. The economy is doing good there, so the schools are taken care of and everybody's happy. And it really is this question of this deviant label that's been applied. So people say, uh, because you're criminals, you, you're obviously, you just want to grow weed because you're lazy and you don't want to work hard. And in reality, that's not what it is. Cannabis farmers grow cannabis because it's the only farming occupation that allows you to still maintain a solid living and stay on your parcel. Most farmers in this country pay for the privilege of growing food with an off-farm job. So, as a society, we would do well to think about it. And there's, you know, the buyers, you know, it's like I've talked to a lot of big brokers over the years. They come here for a reason. They got big money and they can go anywhere. They come here for a reason. And it's not because, well, it's all outlaws and there's just some weed here. It's because there's something special here. We have what's called terroir. The French speak of this in terms of wine. And the idea is that specific microclimates, specific soils, the choices that the farmer puts into the soil, the love and intention, the choices of strains, of cultivars, yields a special product. And that's what we have in this county, special product. And it's been that way for decades. And as a culture, we have a, a tremendous opportunity here. Well, you know, whether you like weed or not, I bet you like school children having good tax money so they get new books. And this is one of those things where um, I don't think any of us like trespass grows. And e even whether, whether you like weed or not, if you can figure out a system that honors and incentivizes good practice, then we deal with all the bad things. Making it more illegal, changing the, le it's not, you know, it's, it's here, it's been here, it's not going anywhere. That was one of the interesting things that the, the, one of the Central Valley Assembly members asked. He said, so you're going to create a water discharge permit that makes, you know, so you have to have a legal permit for farms that are illegal and don't care about permits. So the idea is it doesn't do any good to keep making sticks unless we build a pathway to compliance. And that's the idea is letting farmers demonstrate the quality of their products so that they get the value out of the market. The value is there. It has not changed. The price on the street has gone up in the last 15 years, while the price to farmer has gone down 60 to 75%.
So all we have to do is recapture some of that value for our small farmers through things like CSAs and farmers markets, and we change the dynamic incredibly. What I've found going to Emerald Cup, doing some of these events in San Francisco where we stand across the table and meet customers, it, they sign up for our collective. It's a legal uh, reimbursement for our loving intention that we put into the medicine. The whole idea fulfills what it means to be a farmer. Standing across the vegetable table, people say, I really love your vegetables. That's what makes it worthwhile, because it's not about the pay. Same thing with cannabis. The economics is great, that, that's one thing, but if you play baseball so much that you love to do it so much that you play it professionally, you get good money for it. We love cannabis so much that we play it professionally. And I don't, it's like, I'm not greedy, but I want to be able to make a fair living for what I do, and in the open market, that, that value exists for me. And, and that's, that, I think, is something that needs to be understood, is that as farmers, the more we're able to access the open market, this, the cannabis that comes from Mendocino County is the kind of cannabis the consumer wants. So I've been living in Willits for six years and I really like it here. So, but I'm also, unfortunately, a fear-based person. So I'm gonna put out a few of my concerns, fears. And I have to say that everything Casey said has made me less afraid. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, like one of my fears is we're talking about if people get organized and my experience in Willis is people aren't very organized. So that scares me. Uh, that's when one of the things is like, are people actually gonna make stuff happen? Or, you know, a fear that the corporations are going to offer a lot of money to people for their property and people are gonna sell out and they're gonna like start to like cancer, like just become more of a presence here. Um, I'm, a, I'm I'm very tapped, I'm not a business person, but I'm very tapped into the big picture, so I definitely am a corporophobe, maybe. So I'm worried that they're going to ruin the special pot, so because they want to take, take that niche away from us. Also, like the bypass, when the bypass, you know, looked like it was going to happen, I was like telling Pete, we have to make, well, it's a destination place. That's what needs to happen, a destination place. So if we, um, you know, take the, the bypass issue and the destination place, and then we, we have this, like, great, this isn't a fear thing, this is a, a positive thing, um, that, you know, what about, like, Holland that has pot cafes, and people know that they can stop here, have some really good organic coffee, and maybe a little snack, and smoke a little pot right there in a, in a uh, what do you call it, a little patio some area. Little yeah, together and have it be in some music and poetry readings and you know. So I was thinking that would be a really uh, great um, reason to stop in Willits um, for a lot of people. So that made me, the idea of that and the idea of me going and sitting and doing that <laughs> made me happy too. I guess the only other, uh, question that I have is, um, you know, I believe that hemp, commercial hemp, can solve almost every, if not every, problem. You know, it can't, can't end hatred and imperialism, but it could, add, it can definitely, you know, help with a lot of things. And I'm educated about that. So, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, what the connection is like. The more legal things are, the more likely the federal government will stop outlying commercial hemp, and does anyone think that this area could be a commercial hemp? Uh, I'm a pothead, so I don't want to not have that, but um, I'm not a grower, but I'm a pothead. Um, yeah, you know, is it possible for commercial hemp to be a thing here? Okay. So, you know, most likely what would happen is localities would take a vote. Um, I'm pretty confident the Triangle would vote non-hemp, uh, more cannabis production. But where I see it really being valuable is back east. My partner Amber is from Ohio, and like, we go back there, and the countryside's desolate. And it's essentially a, a direct result of a policy that encouraged farmers to stop producing lots of different things for themselves and to purchase most things from the store and to specialize their crop and only produce one crop and buy more mechanization and more chemicals and more fertilizers. So the idea is that hemp, more diversified crops. This is how we put people back on the land. Not at, you know, in Ohio, they're probably not gonna fire up connoisseur flower production, but they could grow fields and fields of hemp. 
And so what we've seen here in, in this area is this creation of small farms that have been supported by cannabis. And it can be cannabis, the psychoactive version, it can be the hemp version. It can support small farms everywhere. And so we've created a prototype here that really um, stands for something much bigger and larger when you look at the national picture. I mean, we've lost, and this is a nation of small farms and they don't really exist anymore. So um, how we bring them back, do we want to bring them back? It's my fervent hope that we do. And um, in doing so, hemp, is, you know, hemp and cannabis are crucial options for small farms that we've got to be able to access for the future. And you know, one of those interesting questions about uh, the future is take all the pictures of your Central Valley field of weed and put them up against the pictures of our farms and see which one the consumer buys. You know, it's, it's marketing, it's branding. We start to reach that point where we got something special. All we got to do is stand for it. It's a can of tourism. Um, we're talking about, uh, we're, we're negotiating about how much we're going to charge to bring tourists to the farm. And, and so it's, you know, people, it, it, long term, um, you're going to get, you're going to come to my farm and pay me to trim so that you can take cannabis home with you. And, you and, and, and so that's the whole idea is people want to come to our area. They love Mendocino County. They also love weed. Uh, the Salinas Valley is a beautiful farmland that grows a large percentage of all the vegetables, et cetera, in our whole country. Uh, we have a problem to address, and that's water. Definitely have a water problem. Uh, the question that always occurs to me, if, it, if marijuana is made legal, you as a farmer, uh, is this area unique enough to provide the, the, the product economically as well as if, it, if you were over in the valley? If, the, if it was legal everywhere, then would this be the place? That's my question. Now, I've, I've heard your, your pitch, and I, I, I understand you are really sold on this area, and I, I just am curious as to, is there a unique enough uh, element in this area uh, to do the job. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you hear famous wines come from Fresno? Um, I think, Bill, you bring up a really important point, which is water use. And that is not just specific to this industry, but really has to do with how water is getting used all, you know, all over our state and, and across our nation, that I think that we have to deal with that right now. Two things that you brought up that I thought were interesting. One is that I had the opportunity a few years ago um, to do one of those massive bike rides. We rode our bikes from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And so it took us through the Salinas Valley and my um, father still lives down there. I've always heard that it's, you know, the bread basket of the United States is the Salinas Valley. And what we found is acres and acres of wine. Uh, most, you know, there was very few, in you know Monterey, there's the Brussels sprouts and you know things like that, and our strawberries. Most of our strawberries come from Watsonville. But I was really struck by how many farmers had taken out their crops and put in wine, and that is purely economical. The other thing that you brought up, and I mentioned that my dad lives in Monterey, and he is just beside himself with the fact that they are the political leaders down there are selling paper water. They're basically saying, you as a developer have the right to develop this many homes. And my father, who's a poet and an artist, was like, well, I'd like to see you drink that paper water because they're already, the Carmel River is running dry because there's, there's too many straws in the, in the glass. So things that Ukiah is, Ukiah is working on um, using treated sewer water for their agricultural crops. I mean, we need to think about this. We need to think about the fact that we're flushing gallons and gallons of, of fresh, clean, treated water down the toilet. <laughs> we, we need to think of a lot of different ways to go about it. But I know that if any group of our population is really concerned about water, it's the agricultural sector. I want to put in with the others of us here who have said, let's keep talking. This is I've lived here for 11 years, and it's always been this sneaky thing that nobody can really talk about. So uh, yay for uh, whoever put it on. I wish there were some more, like some doctors here talking about the medical benefits. 
I want to say, um, I want to ask a question and I want to say this. I'm a marriage and family therapist and I've been one for 25 years and I see people, I would say just about every day, who are suffering the effects of side effects from all sorts of drugs that are prescribed them absolutely legitimately and sincerely by their doctors that I don't mean to come down and there are people on a dozen drugs. They don't know what it's like to not have 10 things going on with them. Depression, anxiety, insomnia, uh, ADD, um, some autism studies, really interesting and promising, you know, and you guys know more, uh, arthritis and cancer and all sorts of things. We're trying, but um, my experience with people, and I know this is anecdotal, but nevertheless, people who say, oh, I'm smoking pot at night and I'm sleeping really well or my kid is really calming down, it's accommodative. And there's all these different uses. I sure would like to have this legitimized and expanded so we can take care of people without ghastly side effects. Okay? So that... <laughs> the, <laughs> thanks. the other one is <laughs> also maybe anecdotally, I'm sure we all know people who are... Um, they have even had Sheriff Allman inspect their little grows. They're getting, uh, the SWAT teams are coming and arriving and stealing their stuff and stealing money that never gets recorded. I hear these horrendous stories. I'm sure a lot of people know them. And I, so what is the interface? Can anyone tell me that between the feds and the state? Thank you. You know, I think the interface changes as farmers get organized, as we learn to represent. You know, water is the main, water is the crux of the whole issue. For us, we made the investment in ponds so that we store water. We, all of our agricultural water is stored so that during the summer we're a net contributor to the environment of water. And that's something that's been very important to us. Uh, another question, the quality issue, as, a, as an Emerald Cup judge, um, I, I see the quality from all over the state. I see the entries from all over the place, and they're all really nice, but Mendocino County pretty much takes it home. And this is pretty consistent. So there, you know, it, it's, it's regardless of what may happen when farmers who are not skilled in it and have never done it before fire up in the Central Valley, um, farmers who have been doing it all over the state for a long time, the best come from here. On the law enforcement side, I. I do really want to thank the town hall. The town hall group has taken on many different um, subjects to talk about, and I, I'm willing to bet that next month it's going to be something different again. But I think as far as our community conversation, it might be really valuable to bring law enforcement into the conversation. Uh, I know that um, you know the sheriff has, has spoken up in Laytonville a couple of times. Um, and I think I just mentioned that I believe he just went to Colorado, so he might have some thoughts on what could be done here locally. But, you know, I can't speak to how the feds are going to relate to the to the state or, you know, I don't that's not my expertise. So it might really be a valuable thing to discuss in some sort of facilitated way. I mean, I think that's that would be the challenge is that. I'm sure that our law enforcement officers would not enjoy coming here if they were just going to be yelled at about, you know, past things that have happened or something. But, you know, if there could be, <laughs> my understanding that what, is that what happened in Laytonville, I believe Hezekiah Allen was there, and he really facilitated a positive conversation about what was going on last summer. So I just... I don't think that will be a topic for this group necessarily in the immediate future, but someone should take that on to do further exploration about how the law enforcement aspect is going to change, because that's going to be interesting. There's, I mean, just talk about sheriff's budget funding and how that all happens. I think that would be a really important discussion. I can see by looking out at the group that obviously this is a topic that people were interested in finding more about and being able to voice their own ideas about it. We can't do that in a vacuum. It has to happen by getting together. So thank you all for coming and being a part of it.